Hi everyone, welcome back. I'm Steve Brunton, and I'm really excited today to tell you about dynamical systems and this lecture on the anatomy of a dynamical system, how you build them, how you analyze them, how you understand them. I absolutely love dynamical systems. Uh, they are our models for the evolving world around us. So they describe the rich behavior of mixing fluids. They're how we build models uh, that we would use to design rockets and land them. Uh, we use dynamical systems to understand the brain, disease networks, social networks, uh, you name it. Dynamical systems describe the evolving world around us. And this is really why I went into applied math and science and engineering in the first place, is to model these uh, rich systems that change uh, and that we interact with, these dynamical systems. So this is gonna be a video on the anatomy of a dynamical system. What are the challenges of modern dynamical systems to describe these really complex systems of interest? Uh, and what are some of the high level objectives we have when we're working with dynamical systems? So I hope you enjoy this. Um, this is oftentimes kind of an intro uh, piece of a longer lecture on how you would use machine learning to learn these dynamical systems or to learn how to control these systems. But I think this can be kind of a standalone uh, little piece on understanding what are the, the integral parts, the bits and pieces that go together to make up a dynamical system. So dynamical systems are our models of reality. They are how we describe the world around us, especially how things change and co-evolve in time. So dynamical systems are fundamentally linked to time and how systems change in time. Okay, so this is our uh, kind of simple model of a dynamical system. It's a system of coupled differential equations. Uh, X is a vector that represents the state of our system. It is a vector that has the minimal number set of values that you need to describe your system. So for example, if I have a pendulum, then that pendulum is uniquely defined not just by its angle theta, but by its angular rate theta dot. So the state of that pendulum system is theta and theta dot in a vector, okay? So that's what x is. x is a vector of the state of your system. Um, if I'm looking at the stock market, the state of the system might be the value in all of the stocks, and there might be more information that needs to go into that state vector. If I'm looking at the weather, uh, it might be the weather condition on a one kilometer grid on planet Earth. Okay, so the state vector X can get very, very large, but it's a unique minimal description of the system you care about. Okay, F is what we call the dynamics. It's a set of functions, F1, F2, F3, that describe the dynamics of state one, state two, state three. So the time derivative of X1 will be given by the first row equation, F1. And the time dynamics of X2 are given by F2, and so on and so forth. So F is a vector valued function that tells me given a current state X, how does that state change in the next time instant? Okay, so that is the dynamics. It's a set of functions. Oftentimes this is given by like Newton's second law or something like that. And we sometimes say that this is a vector field because for every point in space X, this vector field essentially tells you um, how the derivative is pointing and what vector direction X dot is pointing at that point in space. So it's a field of these direction vectors. T is time, and this is really important because in lots of dynamical systems, the system itself changes in time. Okay, this is super important. Think about your brain state. Your brain state, the, the dynamics, the equations that would describe how your brain works are fundamentally different when you're sitting here watching a video lecture versus when you're asleep. Different dynamics, okay? So this is time varying. Uh, the weather might change, the climate might change. Maybe we are actively changing the dynamics of a system. Uh, okay, the ocean dynamics, the vector field of the ocean changes in time. Good. Uh, you are all of the variables that we have active control over. So maybe we have some variables we can manipulate uh, to try to change the behavior of the system. Those are our control knobs, and those go in this vector U. So in the case of the pendulum, maybe I put that pendulum on a cart and I can accelerate that cart. I can drive that cart around and that would be my control input U to try to change the dynamics of my system. Beta are all of the other parameters of the system that I don't explicitly have control over, but I might want to analyze and understand. So in the pendulum example, this might be like the length of the pendulum arm or the mass of the pendulum, things like that. 
And so these beta parameters, uh, we want to understand the explicit dependence of these dynamics on those beta parameters. As I change those parameters, I might get really big changes in the dynamics called bifurcations. And so these beta parameters are super important. Good. So that's our dynamical system. Now, in addition, we also have measurements of our system. So we don't always have access to this full state X because maybe my system's exceedingly large. You can't measure all of the brain, all of the neurons in your brain. That would be you know, completely impractical. So maybe you can measure a really, really small subset or even some uh, crude measurement, some proxy measurement like a EKG or EEG or something like that. So you have these measurements in Y. Uh, and I, now that we've kind of talked about what is the anatomy of a dynamical system, I want to walk you through what are the modern challenges. So people have been writing down dynamical systems and studying them and analyzing them for centuries, right? Newton's law, second law, is a dynamical system. That was kind of the, the beginning of our, our foray into dynamical systems. But in the modern era, a lot has changed, and there are some big challenges uh, that we're able to start tackling now. Okay, and so that's, that's really what I want to talk about here. So in modern dynamical systems, some of the biggest challenges, probably the biggest one that goes uh, unmentioned in a lot of cases, is that in most situations we actually don't know F. We don't know the dynamics. We don't have a model of our system. So for mechanical systems like the pendulum, yes, you can derive you know, Newton's laws or the Lagrangian or the Hamiltonian, and you can derive these equations of motion from first principles. That's like you crack your physics book and you derive this system from scratch. That's how we you know, used to do things. That's how we do things when we can. But for modern systems of interest, we don't have access to these governing equations in F. There is no known master equation for how your brain works. We don't know the F for a brain. We don't know the F for a disease network. We have models, we have approximations, but we can't agree on one governing physical law for how a disease spreads or how the climate works. Okay? So modern systems of interest, F is often unknown. Even in systems where you do know F, like the Navier-Stokes equations for a fluid, it might be far too complicated to use, and so we would need to learn a reduced order model in terms of the things we care about, in terms of a less descriptive state X that captures the big things I care about in my fluid. The other really, really big challenge in dynamical systems, and I think this, uh, this one is really maybe tied for number one, is nonlinearity. So this function f in general for systems of interest is often nonlinear. Uh, and that means superposition of solutions doesn't hold. If my dynamics were linear, if x dot equaled a matrix A times x, everything would be simple. There would be a canonical closed form solution. You could just write down the solution and go home we would all be out of business. So nonlinearity is what gives us job security in dynamical systems. This is the real challenge uh, in many systems, is that even small amounts of nonlinearity make it so there are not closed form solutions in general. There are special classes of nonlinear systems and special solutions that you can find, but there is no generic one-size-fits-all nonlinear uh, theory of nonlinear dynamical systems. So that's really interesting. And most systems we care about are nonlinear. Other challenges are dimensionality of the state vector x. Uh, so for many, many systems, this state vector x might be exceedingly complex. I think in your brain, there are estimates that you have 100 billion neurons. That's a 100 billion dimensional state vector just to describe the state of all of those neurons uniquely. Describing the climate or the weather is also a very, very massive problem. Uh, if you want to get a really good description of weather on planet Earth, you need a very high resolution, and Earth's pretty big. Okay, uh, disease modeling, if you want to actually do a good job of this, you really need to figure out like the network of how people interact. And that's, you know, there's billions of us and there's tons of connections in this network. So it's super complicated, high dimensional dynamics in a lot of cases, and that makes it really hard to analyze these. Along with dimensionality is multi-scale. So these dynamical systems uh, are not just big, but there's a range of scales from you know, big scales all the way to really, really small scales. So think about weather or, or climate. Um, you know, on the scale of the size of Earth, there are things I care about. There are seasonal changes, you know, big hurricanes, but little teeny tiny features also might matter for the weather prediction three weeks out. Okay, so you have this range of scales you care about. Your brain also is 
fundamentally multi-scale spatially. There's regions, and then those regions are composed of you know individual neurons and things. But there's also multi-scale in time. You're listening to me talk about this right now. You're hearing words I'm saying on seconds. You're connecting that to things I told you a few minutes ago. But you also have this lifetime of experience over months and years. So you're extremely multi-scale in time. Dynamical systems are fundamentally chaotic in a lot of situations. So not all nonlinear systems are chaotic, but many of them are. And what that means is that you get a very sensitive dependence of the outcome of these systems. You get a very, the future depends very strongly on small changes uh, on the initial condition and the parameters and the dynamics now. So if you have your system and you change your parameter even by a little bit, you might get very, very different phenomena. Or if you change your initial condition a little bit, you might go to very different places. And that makes it really hard to predict uh, these systems. So that's actually why weather is so hard to predict. You know, we can't predict three weeks out because this is a super chaotic system and we can only measure the system so accurately and we only can describe the equation so accurately and the parameters so accurately. So chaos is, is still a huge problem. Uh, latent variables, hidden variables, again, this is related to dimensionality. If I have a big state vector, chances are I'm not measuring everything. You can't measure all of the neurons in your brain. Uh, you might only measure a few of them. You might only have a proxy measurement. So latent variables, hidden variables is a big deal. They might matter a lot and you can't measure them. What do you do in those situations? Uh, all real dynamical systems have disturbances and noise, and you have to consider this. So your dynamical system is going to be forced by ex external disturbances, stochastic forcing, and your measurements are going to have noise. And you can't always just assume that these are Gaussian white noise processes like uh, what we do in textbooks because that's the only thing that we can actually solve. In the real world, you're probably going to have correlated, structured, biased noise and disturbance terms. And all of this gets wrapped up into this concept of uncertainty. There's a huge amount of uncertainty in every single piece of this dynamical system. Uh, I have uncertainty in the model F. I have uncertainty in the parameters beta. I have uncertainty in what I'm measuring and how it's being measured. I might even have uncertainty in the measurement time of when I take that measurement. I mean, there's all kinds of uncertainty, and that all will uh, kind of uh, conspire to make this a very challenging problem. Okay. Um, and I have an asterisk on the challenges because I want to point out that most, maybe not all, but most of these problems can be recast as optimization problems. So kind of optimally handling noise and disturbances for future predictions or estimation optimally propagating uncertainty in the future, um, and so on and so forth. Optimally reconstructing the full state from limited uh, measurements Y. And when I say that this is an optimization problem, you should be thinking now, I can probably start using tools from machine learning. Because machine learning is just optimization based on data. It's building models using optimization and a wealth of data. And so this is really nice because modern dynamical systems, kind of the anatomy of a dynamical system, allows you to focus on individual tasks and challenges with these emerging optimization techniques. Okay, good. So now that we've understood kind of the anatomy of this dynamical system, I want to talk a little bit about how we would use it. Uh, and there's so many uses, I'm just going to, you know, briefly, briefly touch on some of them. Of course, we might want to predict the future state of the system. Uh, so I might want to predict the weather a week from now. Um, I, when I think of future state prediction, I think of, you know, what if someone's lost at sea? Okay, so we had some rough idea of their initial condition, and we want to integrate where we think they'll be two hours later. Okay, so that's a future prediction. And the future prediction doesn't have to be deterministic. It might be statistical. I might have to run an ensemble of initial conditions. Maybe I have uncertainty of where that person was lost at sea. Or maybe this is the Gulf oil spill and I don't know exactly where the oil is coming up. So I have a Gaussian of uncertainty and I want to propagate that uh, into a future estimate of where the distribution of oil will be. So that's a statistical or an ensemble prediction. And I'll point out, all of these topics, every term in this dynamical system, every one of those challenges, every one of these uses, there are dozens if not hundreds of people diligently working on these problems. These are not uh, challenges, these are whole careers, okay? Uh, design optimization, that's another big use of dynamical systems models. What I might want to do is now that I have a model of my system, I might want to design betas to get a performance or an output 
that is desirable. So think Formula One cars or super yachts or rocket engines. I want to design the parameters of my system to get some desired high level output like drag and lift and things like that. Okay, And so that requires you to be able to understand how your system depends on these parameters. Now, if you do that optimization in real time based on your measurements, that would be called feedback control. So if you can actively manipulate uh, some part of your system in real time, those parameters become actuators and this becomes a feedback control problem. And that would be really satisfying uh, and incredibly useful in many, many systems if we could actively control them uh, to some engineering uh, you know, specifications. Now, most of the, the first uses are very practical, very engineering oriented, but we also as humans deeply care about understanding the world around us. We don't just want to manipulate it. We don't just want to predict it. We want to understand fundamentally how and why it works. Okay? And these dynamical systems give you a very uh, kind of intuitive way of understanding how the world evolves and what are the rules for how that evolves. And so there's a couple of kind of uh, keywords here that I think are really important, interpretable and generalizable. So interpretable means that this model is not so complex that I can't communicate with you about it. We could, if, if this model is not too complicated, we can talk about it, we can try to understand it, we can communicate and interpret this model. Generalizable is also really important. If I write down this model, I want it to be useful in other scenarios that I might not have thought of. So being, you know, having some generality in how it how this model works, even for parameters I haven't tested, that's really important. And I always think of Newton's second law as kind of the ultimate interpretable and generalizable dynamical systems model, F equals MA. It's super simple, so we can interpret and understand it. It is very generalizable. It works in so many scenarios, um, you know, for different parameters, for different state vectors, and so on. And it fundamentally has changed the way that we understand with uh, and interact with the world. So we understand the world better because uh, of that interpretable model. Okay, good. So uh, that's kind of the overview of the anatomy of a dynamical system. I strongly encourage you to start playing around with systems yourself. Pick a system that you're interested in, the brain or uh, an epidemiological system or the climate. Pick something interesting and start thinking to yourself, what would be a state vector of that system? What would be the control inputs and the parameters? What might be some rules for how that system evolves in time? What can I measure? And start thinking about how those challenges and these uses fit into your understanding of your dynamical system. All right, thank you.